Thank you very much. Uh, before we get started, I would just like to uh, thank uh, um, Kenton and, and Dan uh, for um, uh, selecting me to appear on this series. It's always nice to uh, reach out to um, uh, people you know uh, and tell them something maybe they don't know that you know. Uh, and it's also uh, nice to uh, meet new people and, and share what I think has been really some very, very interesting uh, work. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, several sabbatical leave committees and dean, former class dean Catherine Aiken uh, who have extended some, uh, me uh, two sabbaticals during the time I've been at the UI. Uh, and I've conducted this work before, during, and after these, these sabbaticals. So the, the breaks have, have really been uh, very, very nourishing. Um, first of all, um, uh, just a little um, apologia. Um, <clears throat> nominally, this topic is about opera, but I'm going to promise you, if you're not really an opera fan, there will be no singing today. Uh, I don't do that. Uh, there are actually singers present in, in the room, and I, I wouldn't want to uh, insult them. And actually, you don't even have to really like opera uh, to enjoy this presentation, because really what I'm going to talk about today uh, is more about research techniques and the sorts of information that you can uncover from um, f fun and funny uh, archival sources. So anyway, um, I, I almost can't remember when I started on this project because it's been such a part of my life for uh, a, a long time, but I think it probably goes back to my doctoral dissertation. Uh, you know, there's that joke about um, you're, you're just trying to drain the swamp and then you realize that you're up to your neck in, in alligators. And the particular swamp that I was trying to drain uh, was um, uh, a series of concert, or what I thought were concert reviews from early 19th century uh, Vienna that were published in a German uh, periodical called the Allgemeine Musikalische Zeitung, or General Musical Times. And so I thought, well, Vienna, there's always a lot happening in Vienna, and so that would be uh, a real good uh, place to focus my um, my research. And so I thought, well, there'd be all kinds of fascinating instrumental concerts, which since I'm an oboist, that would be quite relevant. Um, only when I started reading the fine print, uh, I discovered that it was mostly about opera. And so I thought, okay, well, that's interesting too. No problem there. You know, I like Mozart and the people who came after, after him, so, uh, so that's very good. And so Anyway, the thing about these opera productions is that they featured singers that I'd never heard of. Now, I have to tell you that the Mozart people have pretty much covered you know, every little detail about all the singers who sang in Mozart's operas while he was still alive. And then it kind of thins out after that until, you know, like Bellini and Donizetti and, and well, Verdi and Wagner, you know, that's when the, the coverage really picks up. But there's this vast uh, sort of unexplored uh, land in between the major events. And um, so, and it's particularly in Vienna. So I thought, well, this would really be um, a good, good thing to, to study, um, you know, nature abhors a vacuum and all that. So I focused on, on the um, period beginning just after, or, or close to the death of Mozart, figuring that's safe, because those Mozart scholars, they're vicious. You want to stay out of their way as much as possible. You know, that's, isn't that one of the goals of research, is find uh, unknown stuff. And I'm planning ultimately to go up till 1810 because that's when there was an important administrative division in the, the court theater companies overall and where the opera company moved into its own um, dedicated theater instead of rotating back and forth between, uh, between two. Uh, but 1805 was kind of a critical watershed year and um, uh, so that's where I'm staying for, for today. Well, all I was trying to do was to find out a little birth and death information and maybe a few highlights along the way for some of the singers that nobody ever heard of. Uh, but what I was not expecting to find was A, total addiction, and B, uh, the fact that you could reconstruct an awful lot of these people's daily lives, which then uh, can be extended into the, um, the, the context overall. So anyway, just to give you some, some background, um, my study focuses in Vienna, capital city of the Holy Roman Empire, which is a really very strange name and it was a very strange entity. Um, 
I think uh, Bernard Shaw said it was neither holy nor Roman, and that's you know really pretty, uh, pretty uh, clear. Actually, if we called it the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, uh, which was also an operative term, well, that would be a little closer to it. So basically, what the Holy Roman Empire was uh, during this period was <clears throat> the German-speaking lands of the southern German-speaking lands, not Prussia. You know, that was, that was something else. And a good chunk of northern Italy, where the Habsburgs had some, uh, who, was the ruling, who were the ruling dynasty, uh, had some, uh, some hereditary uh, territories. Uh, back in the day, it was referred to as the imperial capital and residence city. And you might think, well, big deal. Well, um, they had to, to be specific uh, because Vienna was the, uh, the government capital, but it was also where the ruling emperors lived. And so they had to be specific. I mean, back in the 16th century, the emperors used to move around. And so maybe Vienna would be the capital uh, for government purposes, but they really liked to live in, in Innsbruck, which is a nice place you could kind of understand. So anyway, the emperors uh, who affected uh, opera and theater overall, I should really think about, think of, we should think of this as theater, begins with Joseph II. And if you remember the movie Amadeus, you remember he was the sort of the wet blanket who discouraged ballet. Liked music, but discouraged ballet. Well, it turns out that he didn't much like ballet. I don't know why. Um, but um, in 1776, he assumed the title of superintendent of the theaters, and um, his, his bag was reform. He wanted to make things work more efficiently. Actually, what it was uh, was a feeling of, of competition uh, with Prussia and Berlin, uh, which had uh, administratively, uh, I think, had things a little bit better figured out. And so Joseph certainly wanted to make sure that his state was plenty modern and uh, would run for the benefit of his subjects, whether they liked it or not. Well, Joseph, uh, one of the good things about being emperor is you got to choose what, you, what the people saw in the theaters. It was like, you know, having the remote on Super Bowl weekend, you know, and then you are the king of the channels or queen of the channels. Well, uh, Joseph decided that the Italian opera company was just too expensive. You know, the Italian singers were temperamental and um, uh, expensive, you know, because they, you had to pay travel expenses for them. And they weren't singing in the language of the people. So he got rid of Italian opera and says, from now on, we have German opera. Well, that didn't go over real well with the nobility, who really liked Italian opera, but it was a good start. And what it was said about Joseph is that he was very interested in promoting Germ a Germanic state. Um, he also got rid of the French theater and uh, wanted to make sure that the plays that were, that the spoken plays were of a high literary quality, so he brought in Shakespeare and uh, uh, good French plays and, and, and such as that. And then he went off to war and he died. Okay, uh, died without any children. And so in the way that the, the, the primogenitor uh, worked back then, uh, the succession went to his brother, Leopold II. Now Leopold had spent the past 25 years as Grand Duke of Tuscany living in the beautiful city of Florence. And so he liked Italian things a whole lot and really didn't care for much about uh, German things. And his wife, who had grown up in Spain as the Infanta there, uh, really didn't like German singing at all, described it as German piggishness. And I'm sure with you know, a bunch of Teutonic grunting and, and, and uh, uh, squeaking and, and, and such. And so uh, Leopold II got to choose you know, what was shown in his court theaters. And so German opera, gone. Italian opera, back. Particularly comic opera. He didn't care too much for the mythological uh, um, you know, opera seria, serious opera subjects, but he liked a good comedy. So basically he liked sitcom. Uh, he really liked ballet. Uh, actually, Leopold uh, seems to have been quite the womanizer, and my guess is that ballet represented uh, for him a socially acceptable form of ogling uh, women in attractive ballet costumes. 
Well, also, it was, it was very grand, heroic ballet, actually, with a great deal of French influence, and he just thought it was, it was good. He was the emperor. He got to choose. So, kept German theater. Italian opera is back, but comic subjects appealing and ballet. Well, unfortunately, uh, Leopold did not have very long to, to reign. He caught some disease that was going around, probably uh, a flu or, the, or a cold, something like that. Uh, and in that respect, you know, when you start looking at how people die, you realize that there was something very democratic about that. You know, there weren't um, aristocratic diseases in every other people uh, kind, of, kind of diseases. You know, the aristos could die of smallpox and cholera and uh, tuberculosis and um, some mysterious ailment called nerve fever. We still don't know what that was. But anyway, um, the, the truth of it was a lot of people just didn't live all that long. That's one of the things that you learn from a topic like this. So anyway, Leopold had quite a few children. Uh, and one of them, his oldest son, was a guy by the name of Franz who was 24 years old when he uh, was elected uh, emperor and received the, the other crowns of king of, uh, king of Bohemia, king of Hungary, and other territories as, as well. The reason that there's a slash, um, Franz the second slash first, it looks almost like an, oops, we got the number wrong. The reason for that has to do with politics. Um, Franz came of age at a really very difficult time historically. There was this little fracas going on in France called the French Revolution that broke out in 1789. And unfortunately, um, uh, two, of it, two of its victims were Franz's aunt and uncle. Uh, the, the aunt was uh, Marie Antoinette, who had been a sister of Joseph and Leopold. And of course, the uncle was Louis XVI, who of course both lost their heads to the to the guillotine. And um, um, within about six weeks of Franz's accession to the imperial th uh, throne, uh, France declared war on Austria in general and on Franz in particular. And so then you, if you scratch back, uh, scratch the inner recesses of your mind, you might remember, oh yes, um, there was a long period of wars that, that, that followed. After the French Revolution, there was a guy by the name of Napoleon who came to power around uh, roughly 1800 uh, <clears throat> and um, led the French uh, initially to victory and then ultimately to uh, resounding defeat, uh, but things weren't wrapped up until 1815. Well, you might remember one of the important events in, in Napoleon's life uh, was when he um, became emperor, had himself crowned uh, hereditary emperor of the French, <clears throat> and actually placed the crown on his own head. I mean, what, you know, what hubris. Um, but anyway, Franz our Austrian Franz could kind of see what was coming after uh, Napoleon had himself crowned, and so he could figure, hmm, this Holy Roman Empire is not around for very much longer. I better have a backup plan. And so he created the heredity, um, um, the dual monarchy of Austria and Hungary. So everything was okay. He could still be an emperor, but then he became Franz the first of that new uh, political division. That didn't totally kick in till uh, 1805, which whew, it's just after the period uh, that we're dealing with today. Mo looking at the musicians who were active during, during this time, uh, there are some really heavy hitters. And so uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart was actually born in 1756 in Salzburg, which is today is just a two hour and 20 minute train ride away. Uh, he spent the last decade of his life creating uh, really the, the great masterpieces of, of his overall output. Um, Joseph Haydn moved to Vienna officially in September, around September of 1790 when his patron, Prince Nicholas Esterhazy, of about the past 30 years, uh, kicked the bucket. And, um, uh, but in actuality, Haydn had, had had an apartment in the city of Vienna uh, since about 1760 uh, at least, but he formally moved lock, stock, and barrel to the city during that time, and you can see, well, he um, spent, you know, a good 19 years there. 
Ludwig von Beethoven um, began his life in Bonn, but moved to Vienna in 1792, initially just to study with Haydn, but then ended up making the city uh, his, his home. And then Franz Schubert is actually the only native Viennese who spent his entire life uh, in, in the city. He was born in one of the, the suburbs near, nearby, so he, he qualifies as, as Viennese. So anyway, uh, the opera singers that I'm working with uh, worked sort of in the same milieu as these people here. Just talking a little bit about the court theater establishment, um, it, was, it was quite complex during this particular era after 1791, comprising uh, four distinct uh, companies. And the reason for that, um, the, the time when we have four uh, separate companies operating year round or close to year round, um, stems to Franz's reign and it has a lot to do with political control. Uh, Franz was very conservative and with these, uh, the French Revolutionary uh, Wars going on in the background, he was very nervous, as were all the other monarchs, that something like that could happen in their state. And so he, um, I think on the advice of his advisors, took a bread and circuses approach to um, theatrical support. Uh, that's an ancient Roman um, uh, saying, uh, but basically it has to do with, uh, you know, give the people the public dole and also keep them entertained and they will not give you any trouble. And so Franz cooked up this diabolical master plan of having theatrical entertainments going constantly so that the people would have a place to go. And uh, so he subsidized the court theaters very heavily uh, to a, a sum of 40,000 uh, florins, which was the currency then, per year. Um, and the numeral will have a little bit more, um, I think, uh, more relevance as we get a little farther, farther along. Uh, but figuring in that, uh, that mix there of spoken theater, Italian opera, most of it comic, ballet and German opera, most of it on very understandable subjects very related to Italian comic opera, that there would be something for everybody, at least in the, um, among the aristocracy and the upper middle class. Um, <clears throat> these, um, these four companies played out in two theaters. The Burg Theater was the official court theater and it was located in the imperial court complex. It doesn't, it's no longer standing today, although there is a theater called the Burg Theater, but it's a new building. Then the Kärtner Tor Theater, so, you know, you, the, the great thing about German is you get to learn long vocabulary words. This one was located near the Kärtner Tor or the gate. Um, Vienna at that time was a walled city and in order to enter you had to go through various gates there. And I think you had to show your credentials and, and actually be admitted. And so the Kärtner Tor Theater was by this Kärtner Gate, which uh, ultimately led to the province of Corinthian, Corinthia or Kärnten. And one of the things that's fascinating about that, that is ultimately the Kärtner Tor Theater became the opera theater. And um, it no longer stands today, but uh, after they tore it down, they built what the, the Vienna State Opera Building directly across the street from it. And if for those of you who like uh, confectionery products, <laughs> definitely go to the soccer hotel and have the soccer tort because that is built on the location of the former Kärtner Tor uh, Theater. You know, so you can have your cake and, uh, and hear the singing also. I can't make uh, uh, cake and, and eat it to work, work out there. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the research process. Um, and I'm going to start uh, with the Wienerstadt and Landes Archive, uh, where I have spent many, many happy hours there. And um, that table is my table. That's where I always work, you know, conveniently located near the high tech di uh, digital uh, machinery known as the microfilm readers there. And you can see in the background are orange things that also hold high-tech uh, storage uh, units known as 3x5 cards. <laughs> Some of them aren't even as advanced as 3x5 cards. Some of those are very thin paper slips uh, made by people in the late 19th century uh, who were making various indices of things. And they're, they're really wonderful to have. 
So anyway, uh, I don't know if you can see, the guy in the background uh, is one of the regulars. His name is Matt Berg, and he is a um, um, historian, 20th century historian from John Carroll University in, in Cleveland. So the sort of things that you can find there that, the research, that, that really help your research, death records, those are just marvelous. You know, you, um, um, they're, they're, they're really cool to have because uh, they can give you information such as how old the person was when he or she died, his occupation, a lot of times the hometown. Uh, you can fill in a lot of your missing uh, bits of, of information. Uh, marital status is also good, good to have. Address, things that uh, they couldn't publish in the newspaper. Well, these things were actually collected by the physician who would go to the house where the person died and would verify the death and would also supply cause of death. So you e uh, epidemiologists would have a field day uh, looking at the death, re the death records. One of the things that brings this a little bit closer to us in our locale uh, is that the reason that there are all those microfilm readers there is because we, instead of, of looking at the actual registers, we are encouraged to look at them on microfilm. And the reason that the, those microfilms are available has to do with the Church of Jesus Christ of, of uh, Latter-day Saints, the genealogical pro project. So if you didn't want to make the trip to Vienna, you could go to Salt Lake City uh, and look at the very same, uh, same micro microfilms. Uh, the estate records are also uh, quite, a, quite a find. Uh, for Lassenschaft's Abhandlungen, you know, another wonderfully long German, German uh, word. Um, but estate records uh, generally start off with uh, something called a spares relation, literally means locking document. And that's the sort of the initiating paperwork that records the person's name, occupation, cause of death, uh, age, address, so repeating information, but with some other really critical information, such as any surviving children, um, children of, of majority, and especially underage, um, minor age children. And you might think, why that? And why the breakdown? Well, one of the important things that the government had to do was to establish guardianship for any underage children. Now, um, it looks like there are a couple of students uh, here, and uh, you'll probably be horrified to know that the age of majority was 24. Uh, you know, so you couldn't do anything under your own aegis, like get married or sign business contracts until you'd reached the age of 24. Uh, I think alcohol consumption was exempt from that. Nobody was driving cars, you know, so that didn't, didn't make a whole lot of difference. Uh, but definitely they had to provide for, uh, for the minor, chil minor children financially. That's what that's all about. Census records are kind of cool, too. Uh, I put census because I think that's a, a happier word than simply draft records because beginning in 1805, somebody came up with the idea of it would be really nice to know where the men are who are fit for military service. And so from that date on until into the 1850s, um, uh, every so often, a government worker would come to every house or building in the city and go to all the apartments and take a census of who was living there. And so um, sometimes you can get missing pieces of information like someone's age or their hometown or their occupation, um, and sometimes there will be other real interesting bits of information. Uh, one of the singers I was studying was duly listed uh, in, in one of these census records, uh, along with her husband and her, her brother-in-law, who was um, an art collector and a fur merchant. She'd married well. And it indicated that the brother-in-law was away in Leipzig. Well, he was also a book collector, and Leipzig was the center of a very important annual book fair. And so it gives you a little bit more information just about how people lived back then and what, what, what their interests were, what was in, important to them. And so when you're trying to piece together a biographical story, all these little mosaics, um, little pieces add up to the big pictures overall. So indices, various subjects, uh, <clears throat> there was a, a researcher by the name of Gustav Gugitz who was active 
oh, I think he was like the head librarian at the Staten Landes Archive for about 50 years, 5-0. <clears throat> and um, he seemed to like to make lists of things. And so there are these marvelous uh, three-ring binders of collections that he made. And um, he would go through all these little slips of paper and compile lists of artists so if you're interested in the in the visual arts man he'd have all kinds of, of of information about them or lists of musicians lists of theater people lists of engravers lists of gold workers so you can see ver various arts there and uh, there are similar indices for people who were active in the business world so um, the good things to look at one, uh, one of the things that I found very useful is there are also lists of marriages. Now, if you go to Vienna, there's a church on just about every street corner. I mean, it, it looks like it's, it's a very pious city. Um, and uh, um, the churches were where people uh, registered, you know, um, well, uh, oops, better go back. It's too much, too soon. Uh, people had to, to uh, register baptisms and marriages and deaths uh, in, in the churches. Well, the marriages are particularly interesting uh, because, again, here is a place where you can, can get information about what people did and where they came from. And so um, <clears throat> for people like me, uh, being able to locate marriage records is very Im important. So anyway, the, the marriage uh, registers are, are really good. One of the problems um, is that you have to read the handwriting. You know, and my friend Matt Berg, you know, he might be studying um, oh, how the Nazis handled juvenile delinquency uh, during the Third Reich in Vienna. I think that just sounds like a fascinating topic. When he orders his stuff, there may be lots of it, but it comes in nice big boxes of typewritten documents. <laughs> We, however, in the earlier years, have to read something called current shrift, and it will just bring you back down to elementary schools so fast because it is a separate, uh, um, separate alphabet. And unfortunately, it's kind of faint, so you can't really read the handwritten parts, but it says, spares relation, uh, place of death in the city, in der Stadt, and the name of the deceased Herr Karl Weinmuller. And then it goes on and gives his, his occupation, uh, Ka und Ka Hoftheatersänger, Imperial Royal, that's the KK, um, court theater singer, and then a whole bunch of, of, of other stuff there. And that uh, actually, to an experienced reader, uh, that's not too bad to look at. But it, I'll tell you, it is a different alphabet. And you know the S's are totally different. The A's don't look like capital A's. The B's look like capital A's. Uh, C's, forget about it. Uh, K's, you can kind of figure out after after a while. It's, I would say, it's about halfway to Cyrillic uh, in in its difference between the alphabet that we that we uh, use there. And to get a little bit closer uh, look at it, um, it's a little bit difficult difficult to read out of context there, but. Um, I don't know, the second line down, uh, that starts with an E, Ein I can, I can read it out of context there. But it's, a little, it's very much like learning to read when you're a young kid. I don't know, um, those of you who are close to, to my age uh, might have um, grown up with phonics, where you learned how to sound out each word very carefully. And then uh, a later approach to reading was forget phonics, just people identify the words. Well, I like the phonetic approach myself because I think you can, you know, parse it out. But in actuality, you kind of have to use both approaches uh, when you when you're dealing with a lot of this old, old handwriting. So it's not just that you're de dealing with the tacky German language, but also you've got this strange alphabet that you know Germans don't even know anymore. Uh, it was it was outlawed after World War One because Austria was trying to uh, modernize itself, and so there are just a handful of scholars who focus in this particular period uh, who, who learn it you know, and keep the art alive. I'm proud to be in their, in their midst. But I will say that um, digital photography is a great aid to decoding current shrift uh, because you can blow it up as, as big as you need to be. And so if something's bothering you and you can't sleep at 2 o'clock in the morning and you're thinking, oh gosh, Theresia Saul, 
what was her son's third baptismal name? What was that? And then you can blow it up real big, and if it looks like Vlasius, then you think phonetically, oh, Blasius, the patron saint of wind players. That was his third baptismal name. So anyway, the digital technology is really good for something. So anyway, another arch archive, uh, the Haushofenstadt's archive uh, houses a lot of fascinating government records, and um, unfortunately no picture or anything there. Uh, but um, what, is what has been really helpful to me are payroll account books. Follow the money, you know, like the IRS and the mob. Uh, if you can, can see how much people are paid, you have a good idea of what they were, what they were worth during their time. Um, so, and that's, and it, it's great for, you know, just gossip value. Churches. Okay, uh, thinking back to Joseph II, um, the um, sort of the micromanager in managing uh, emperor, um, he's kind of famous because of what he did to um, uh, burial practices. It's the reason we don't know exactly where Mozart is buried today. He decided people were spending too much money on, on, a bury, on um, their funerals, and so he had everybody just stuck in a, in a, like five or six bodies together in a common grave in a linen sack uh, with a little lime slaked over the top to aid decomp decomposition, and then, you know, you just had to get on with your life, stop that mourning. Well, in 1782, he um, um, closed down most of the monasteries, uh, but these people, you know, these priests had to do some work to justify their existence. So he put the churches in charge of, of record keeping. And so um, beginning with 1783, all churches throughout the Austro-Hungarian um, realm uh, had to keep track of baptisms and marriages, and uh, they would also have, have death records. <clears throat> and so you can obviously get a lot of genealogical information there. The Austrian Theater Library uh, is also another very welcoming site for anybody interested in, in theater history. And um, uh, <clears throat> that little, that, that, the chair by the window that has a, uh, a jacket on it, that's my place. It's place mm -hmm. number five, and my stuff is, is there. And uh, uh, one of the, the big things that help us as theater historians are these bound collections of daily playbills. And they are amazing. They come in books that are about this wide, about like that uh, deep, and this thick. You know, they weigh a, a, a good bit. They, you know, you have two or three of those, and that's heavy, heavy listing. And what they give us is a daily record of what was performed in the two court theaters. The one on the left is the Borg Theater, um, or the court theater called the National Theater sometimes, and the Kärntner Tora Theater is on the right. And um, this item on the left uh, by a very popular <coughs> comic opera composer, Domenico Cimarosa, his uh, secret marriage was really a great hit, and it was written largely for a woman by the name of Irena Tomioni, who is the third character listed as, there as, as Madame Tomioni. And I have studied quite a bit about her. And we have her picture there. Um, going back to those birth records, the reason they're important is that they haven't always kept track of people's births. Men's births, men's baptisms, tended to be taken a little bit more seriously because they could conduct more official business than women could. And so a lot of times you have to take your combination of documents just to try to figure out approximately when a person was, was born. And so um, going with one source I extracted and came up with 1760 as her birth date. Other sources get her closer to 1763. But you know who want, what woman really wants to reveal her um, her birth date? And I oh I see a glaring error. She did not live to 1838. She died in 1830. But we're going to concentrate for the short term a little bit more on her on her life. Uh, one of the reasons that she was quite popular um, is that she was good looking. So it's the same as with the theater people uh, today. Um, <clears throat> and she was paid a whole lot of money. 
Okay. Uh, she was hired under the aegis of Leopold II as a successful uh, prima donna for Italian comic opera. And uh, following the money trail, she was consistently among the highest earners. In fact, um, when she came in uh, at something like 4,100 florins, um, the next, uh, she was right equal with all, with the three top male singers in the Italian Opera Company and stayed up there. The next year her salary went up to 4,500 florins and ultimately um, got up to 5,400, always equal with the, the top, uh, the top uh, baritone, or basses and baritones and tenors. Tenors were not quite as important then. But by way of comparison, the guy who conducted and, and, and um, uh, rehearsed all the time was only making 1,200 florins a year. So you can see who mattered uh, back then. Uh, but to justify that salary, she was on stage every other night. You know, so it was hard work and um, generally um, would involve a new role about every month, every three to four weeks. So um, while these people kept um, certain roles in their sort of active memory, you know, they would play them over and over again. They were also having to acquire new roles constantly. So there was always a lot of rehearsing, a lot of memorization. They earned their salaries. Well, she was married to this guy by the name of Pierre, Pierre Dutilleux. Uh, he was a trailing spouse. You know, just as we deal with spousal accommodation in the universities now, it turns out that the court theaters did that back in the day. And Pierre was kind of useful because he played the violin and he could conduct and he composed reasonably well. And so they put him to work directing the ballets and um, composing ballet music. Uh, but not too strong, I guess. He died at, uh, in, in 1798 of the ever popular nerve fever and uh, whatever that was. And uh, looking at his estate records was just a revelation um, to find they had children. So I'm guessing that probably married couples back then probably did the full range of things that married couples do today and produce these two children. Well, looking at the second one, Michaela, uh, born in 1794, hmm, that's why all her mother was singing with the court opera company. And looking at then going back to the daily playbills, you can see, oh, there was about a five month gap starting on De December 4th, 1793, where it simply announced that a Mademoiselle Celestini or Celestini uh, would be taking over her role in, I can't remember which, which production it was, and then no Tomioni until early May. That woman had a five-month maternity leave. You know, we've just recently talked about uh, expa expanding maternity benefits, uh, well, and, and uh, um, parenting benefits. Um, it's interesting to see such a long time off. Most women got four to six weeks off, but they were Germans. One of the differences between the Germans, uh, German women, is they tended to send their babies out to a wet nurse, and so they could get back on the stage a little bit sooner. Irena was a privileged person. She was the prim prima donna, and s Italians generally nursed their own children, and so here was a cultural difference, but this lady brought in the people, and so she, uh, she was, was worth it. So anyway, you can see, well, um, Michaela in turn had children. Her older, the older daughter, Magdalena, also had children. And so then we're going to fast forward a little bit. You know, there was a lot of living in between then. In 1805, Madame Tomioni uh, left the stage and had about 25 years of retirement. What do you do in order to sustain yourself in retirement to supplement your state pension or to substitute for one if you don't get it? Well, those good old estate documents kind of tell all. Uh, she ended up being a rich woman. Uh, 
2,161 uh, florins of cash on hand was pretty amazing if you compare with her burial expenses at a little bit over 46 florins. And thinking that, say, uh, a poor orchestral musician uh, might have an estate that's only valued at 118 florins. So just thinking of that much cash. But the real kicker is that she owned three houses. Bought the first one in Penzing uh, in 1804. Uh, the third one on Kärntner the big one uh, in 1805, right after or right as she was getting to retire. And then she found a little extra work in 1809 and made a comeback and probably used that windfall cash to buy the house on Rendgasse. And so fortunately, we have the visual evidence of the, the suburban house in, in Penzing, which is uh, one of the western suburbs. Um, uh, it, in, it's fairly near Schönbrunn, and it doesn't look so wonderful today, but it is in pretty close to original condition, except for a little graffiti. Uh, gives you an idea of the situation. Um, that would have been not a paved street back then, but a country lane. And to get an idea of what was really back there in the day, you can see all kinds of vegetation. She had a garden back there, and uh, this was indeed a lovely uh, suburban country retreat. Uh, with um, uh, there was a wine garden back back in the back, so this woman had a lovely life. And the interesting thing here is that she acquired all of this property after she was widowed. She never remarried. So here was somebody who did it on her own. A woman who could sign. Contracts, and this is just one of about a hundred lives that I have been been collecting. So I can see that the, I've I've run off at the mouth a bit. I'm going to have to shut down now, but I would certainly welcome your questions uh, afterwards. Thank you. Yes, Dan. Ah, oh, my biggest surprise. I think it was um, uh, finding this child baptized. Um, that that I could could piece it all all, to, all together. I think just the thought that uh, these people had real lives, like we do, and uh, I think we just had a birth in the school of music, and we're wondering how to handle the maternity leave. And so looking at how they handled maternity leave back then, I think has been the most um, in, informative thing. Although, last, uh, I guess summer before this past one, I discovered that this particular house um, ended up getting sold off in order to pay a bequest to the illegitimate daughter of one of uh, Tomioni's uh, colleagues. You know, so sometimes these things, little bits of information just hit you out of the blue. Barry. Thanks. Um, have, you, have you ever come across discrepancies in like the official records that- Oh, constantly. On the journey of looking to the reputation of the, of the record keepers or anything? Um, yes, constantly. Yes, this business of discrepancies in, in, in dates. Everything was about it back then. And so you could look at um, a marriage certificate and a housing record and find two different dates of birth there. And another thing that, that's tricky is that how do you calculate age? We talk about somebody being X years old, say like 50 years old, having lived for 50 years, but it was just as common back then to talk about being in your 50th year, which would actually uh, mean that you were um, technically 49 years old. So sometimes trying to establish an exact year of birth uh, is, is difficult that, that way. And sometimes they could be as much as a decade off. You know, data was only as good as the person reporting it. You know, same as now. So you kind of take averages. Let's see, Kenton and then Pam. So are the librarians and archivists in Vienna uh, amused that this American keeps coming back summer after summer, or they, that's just... Uh... Oh, yeah, they do. I mean, we, we've all become friendly. And, you know, and to kick the ante up is my husband comes along, too. 
uh, because he does Beethoven studies. And so they know us as the, the American can, can couple. You know, he speaks German really well, and well, she's nice too. Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Pamela? Um, so during this time period, I'm assuming unless you were of nobility, um, to be able to sustain yourself, and especially as well as she sustained herself, I think that would be probably um, a very unusual, so this would be a lucrative job to have if you were good at it. Oh, yes, very much. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. It was nice work if you could get it. One of the things that was interesting that I have, have since figured out is that everybody worked. That was the expectation. Uh, and mostly I focused on, on women because I find them, them interesting. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, there's lots of, of interest, you know, fascinating tidbits about them. But um, from a, we tend to view what women did from a perspective that may be, um, that was in force when our mothers were, were, were uh, alive, um, for some of us, um, of, that, that was formed in the 19th century uh, of the, uh, the woman of leisure who stayed at home and ran the household. And that, you know, my mother was of that, of that type. She did it, did it very well and, you know, did um, uh, charitable, a lot of charitable work. Um, but the reality for most people in the 18th century is that everybody worked. Uh, <clears throat> women of lower classes worked alongside their, their husbands. Many of them ha um, helped run the shops, uh, assisted in um, whatever uh, craft uh, or trade uh, they, they were engaged in. Uh, but everybody pretty much worked. At the um, higher levels, you could be a school teacher or a nun, that was actually a good, good occupation to, to be. Um, one of the attractions of the theater was that you, since you were on stage, you were in the public view, and it was actually an asset towards securing a good husband, which sounds very calculating, but I think that one of the consistencies throughout all time is that a woman's fate is largely determined uh, by whom she marries. And a lot of times, you know, of course, you can, you can't tell in advance how well it's going to work. But if you were on the stage, you were seen, and you were visible, and chances were that you were also attractive and had something to offer in the way of your musical talent. Uh, but also, in learning theatrical crafts, one of the things you gained was the knowledge of how to mix in high society because you would have to play different characters. And so, um, I've actually got a, um, towards the end, this lady right here is a prime example of somebody uh, who did learn how to walk the walk and talk the talk. And her grandfather taught French, so uh, she probably learned that at home. And her father and mother uh, were in some Shakespearean plays, so she probably knew a fair amount about that. Uh, she was very popular on the stage for about four years, and um, um, the brother-in-law of the, or the brother of the art collector I mentioned earlier, uh, ended up marrying her, and so she ended up being fabulously wealthy, and so that was one of the attractions. Yes, being on the stage was was hard work, uh, but the um, uh, it could be lucrative in either from your own earnings or from uh, the 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 situation that you married into. Okay. To take us forward in the 19th century after the period of your research, did the separate opera companies for German operas and Italian operas survive, or were they forced to come up? Ultimately, Italian opera bit the dust. It was expensive to, and um, after the Napoleonic times, um, I think that in, in Austria, in Vienna, they pretty much wanted to promote German operas. And so a lot of times German opera companies would present Italian opera in translation, French opera in translation. And actually, if you go to the Vienna State Opera today, um, most of the productions are, are in German. Occasionally there are some, some Italian ones, but a lot, of the, a lot of the repertoire is given in, in German. It's the language of, of the people. So it was certainly, um, I think, an economic, um, um, it, the economic situation. You know, it was just more feasible uh, than having to try to train German speakers 
uh, to sing Italian because really just the way you form your mouth, it's so different. Um, <clears throat> anyway. Thank you all very much. Sorry. Appreciate it. I invite you to